Okay, so I'd like to um, give my presentation now, which is titled How Hot Are Britain's Coal Fields? Um, so this is a project that's been undertaken by staff at British Geological Survey and the Coal Authority in collaboration with one another. Um, so coal mining in Britain, a brief sort of synopsis. So there's been significant coal mining activity of mainly, but not entirely carboniferous age coals. We mentioned that sort of uh, often stated figure that one in four homes is believed to be located above a coal field. Um, and many subsurface coal mines now since closure require dewatering, uh, if not just to control um, mine water discharges or to protect, for instance, overlying drinking water aquifers. Um, as widespread closure of the mines in the 80s and 90s. And then as the pumps were turned off, a lot of the mines were allowed to refill with water where they were subsurface mines, um, creating, you know, a potentially large resource of otherwise un unusable water, often with um, less favourable chemistry. Um, so why, why map the temperatures of the coal fields, I hear you all asking. So in short, the UK, like the rest of the world, needs to decarbonise its heating and reduce its uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and, you know, coal fields can be used to recover heat, as we've seen from Dave Banks' talk. But first, we need, or maybe we want, some maps. So what would we use maps for? I mean, maps, maps at, at the simplest level can be used as an engagement tool. Policymakers and stakeholders enjoy seeing maps. Um, and the public as well are used to seeing maps, and it's potentially something they can also engage with. But on a more useful level, we could, we can use maps of all various types for parts of early stage feasibility studies. So we'll talk about the temperature maps, but it's worth noting that they are just temperature maps. Um, so don't get too excited. They're not the uh, golden answer to everything. And we'll definitely still need plenty of other factors in here as we go along our path to de-risk and sort of a map potential for mine water heating and cooling and storage schemes. So let's get on to the data that we used. So there was there was no existing temperature map of Britain's coal fields, but there were several sort of um, data sets that we we found or we could use or already existed. So firstly, we compiled um, a lot of data from the Coal Authority's routine downhole geophysics monitoring. Um, and that, that provided a real wealth of information. Uh, there was also existing bottom hole temperature information from, from boreholes intercepting coal fields, whether they were mined or unmined. And also historically, as coal mining operations got deeper, the owners, or at least the government, were concerned with how deep they could physically send a miner before he, and it was probably always a he, um, became overheated and ultimately couldn't work. So there was some sort of health and safety related temperature data collected. Um, over a hundred years ago as well. And some of these were actual coal strata temperatures in active mines. So they would drill a small borehole into the coal face, seal in the thermometer, come back a day or so later, and then take the reading. So they were as good as good as you can get for unaffected coal strata, well, unaffected, at least coal strata temperatures in situ. So in terms of the spatial distribution of the data, um, you can see on the right hand side, the three different data sets are plotted with different um, symbols. And we chose, 
we sort of did a bit of head scratching to see, you know, what would we map these temperature data to. Now, um, the coal fields are separated by the coal authority into to management units called mine water blocks, which are broadly hydrogeologically connected areas of coal fields. So you could have one coal field. So South Wales, where I am now, one coal field that's split into multiple blocks. So we decided that for this attempt, this would make some sense to use these, these um, boundaries. So once we put all the data together, we had to go through it and do some Q&A, you know, which data are we going to use for this map? Which data perhaps are we not going to use? So one thing we did see was that uh, um, some shafts where they had been monitored repeatedly, we had um, some fairly relatively stable or similar temperature gradients, which you can see on this graph. However, where, when pumping was introduced, which you can see from the red line on the right, it obviously results in, in mixing and, and removal of water from the shaft. And, and actually the, the temperature gradient you would measure from that profile on the right would be, well, it would, it would be quite difficult to disentangle. So there's sort of two points we took from this. We split out all of the data from pumping shafts or where they were known to be actively rebounding rapidly. Um, but some general thoughts that actually, you know, maybe pump the activity of pumping could bring more, warmer water up to the surface and, and, and could it reduce pumping head costs? Who knows? Um, but it's always a double-edged sword with a lot of these things and that if you're bringing up deeper, warmer water, actually, could that be where less favourable uh, mine water chemistries are found? So part of the QA there anyway. So another interesting part of this is that we looked at a lot of the old strata temperatures which were measured when the collieries were active. Um, we didn't, we obviously didn't include the air temperature data because that, that clearly is, is affected by uh, all the fans and stuff. Um, but on the left hand side, what you can broadly see is that the grey boxes, which are the strata temperatures, versus the blue boxes, which tend to be the more modern borehole water temperatures, follow a broadly similar trend. Um, and that the median and mean values often are not, not too far apart in the grand scheme of things. Although there's a bit more variation with some of the water borehole temperatures, which probably to be expected. Um, but nonetheless, I think broadly we can um, have some confidence in using some of the older data to perhaps give us a, a eyeball the uh, temperatures of the mine systems post closure. So a useful little tool there. This dashed line really represents where there probably was no subsurface mining, um, hence why there's only water temperatures from boreholes that go below coal fields or, or below the mined area of the coal fields. So we put this data together and, and we produced a series of maps which can be viewed on the Coal Authority web viewer as an open access viewer, along with a lot of their other excellent data. Um, and you can see we've sort of, we mapped uh, the temperatures or estimated the temperatures every 100 meters. So I'll just take you through our coolest temperature at 100 meters depth is 9.7 degrees up in Scotland. Not really a surprise there because it's the furthest north mine water block. And um, we'll just take you for a little trip through the coal fields at 100 meter intervals where coal fields start to be greyed out. It's either where there's no data or we're below the depth of maximum known workings. And there we go, because we all like maximum and minimum. Our maximum recorded temperature was 49 degrees in Yorkshire, so a thousand meters. So, you know, whether that's worth aiming for, who knows? 
Anyway, I was reading a paper by Ian Stewart this week, and he's big on science communication. So I thought I should say that, you know, part of these maps as well were to communicate the general possibilities to the public. So we did have a lot of good press and we did um, TV, radio, blogs, prints, magazines, 180 articles across the sort of digital media. Um, so, you know, that was fairly successful in that aspect. And then the BGS comms teams did pull out some sort of stats. I mean, I, I've sort of cherry picked this one because it was the best one, so I do apologise. Um, but it sort of shows a general sentiment from sort of social media comms and other things towards this. And, and currently, at least based on that press release, you know, the majority was, was neutral. There was 8.8% .8 positive and a small amount negative. So I guess what you can take from this is that's, you know, that's a fairly good starting point for this technology. And we could probably think of other technologies where the sentiment would be perhaps all negative or majority negative. So I think it's within our, it's within our grasp to ensure that the sentiment stays at least neutral or positive because uh, this will help our cause in the future. Um, so in conclusion, um, the measured temperatures and, and thus obviously geothermal gradients are variable across the coal fields. Um, and I showed you the maximum temperatures, but the geothermal gradient overall mean of 24 uh, degrees per kilometer, but up to 34 minimum of 17. So there's variation across the country. And, and what drives this is probably geology and depth ultimately, but there could be other factors at play as well. And, uh, and that will be fun for the scientists and others to disentangle. Um, we've seen that pumping can, can locally impact measured gradients, so it could be a pro or a con sometimes. Um, and also the older strata temperature from operational mines can be usable as well, just as a proxy for modern day flooded temperatures, and that the comms was generally neutral to positive. However, and this is the part where I'll sort of tell you none of our research was potentially that useful. Of course it was, but is that you know temperature is not the sole factor that determines if a scheme is viable. Um, in fact, there are arguably much more important factors, including depth to my mode, sustainable yield, ability to re-inject water, chemistry, consumer confidence in technology, capex, etc. And that's not to put temperature down, it's 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 another factor, but there's more to the, the puzzle than just that. So future work, in my mind anyway, should focus on estimating the heat capacity of coal fields at a national scale if we're really going to quantify the resource, whether it's for heating, cooling, storage, and other things and to ensure that the public perception stays at least neutral to positive, is we really want to make sure we mitigate or avoid any negative consequences of mine water geothermal systems that could put them in bad light in the public's eyes. Um, so maybe interacting schemes, we need to consider how we would model or monitor those to ensure they're successful into the future. Um, and of course, just overall to ensure that we design a national program to ensure that this resource is sustainably managed for the betterment of society into the future. So, Thank you for that and to our partners, the Coal Authority.